welcome. If you are following this path in person, you should be standing right outside the powerhouse on its east side on the path. You should be facing south down the path that runs between the cricket pitch and powerhouse. My name is Miranda and for the next 30 minutes, I will be your guide. As we move together through this experience, I will narrate your path indicating where to go, when to stop, and helping you to visualize the area as it was in 1983. You will walk this path as Benjamin, a fictional student attending Humber College at this time in the Mechanical Solar Engineering Technology Program. The encounters he has with people along this path today are also fictionalized. You will hear another voice, which is that of Benjamin's internal thoughts. Throughout the experience, I will be describing what Benjamin sees, hears, and various actions he takes, such as picking up a piece of paper on the ground. I encourage you to follow along with these directions to further embody the experience, but when you follow any of my directions, please be mindful of your surroundings and travel where it is safe. Let us now step back in time together. Imagine it is 1983 and you are on a break from classes you are taking at Humber College. Having just experienced a frustrating morning in your calculus class, you have wandered away on your lunch break for some peace and quiet by the lakeshore. The next voice you will hear is Benjamin's internal thoughts. So that was our last day to ask questions for the final exam and I got nothing out of it. The topics that are going to be on the exam were on the handout she gave us last week. People shouldn't have to ask a million questions about that. You begin to head south along this path. You will eventually get to an intersection of pathways where you will be able to see Swallow Field to the south. But when you get there, don't cross the street. Remember, we're in 1983, and the paths you will see there don't exist at this point. Instead, you would be walking right into the lake as the shoreline extended much farther north at that time than it does today. This path you are on currently has been in existence for many decades. For a period of time, it was a driveway that led down into a doctor's residence where he lived with his family. The view to your left would have been similar in 1983 to what you are seeing today as there have been trees to shade the cricket pitch there since its creation. The powerhouse that you are moving away from was also present at this time, having been built in 1938. After several years of renovations, it reopened in 2019. The powerhouse and cricket pitch were both originally created for use by the Lakeshore Psychiatric Hospital. I'm not going to think about that exam until the end of the day. I just need to get away from that building for a few minutes to clear my head. I'll have to make this a short walk though, so I can make it back on time for this afternoon's classes. You think about what lies ahead of you for this afternoon. Mechanical drawing, computer programming and controls, and a solar lab. Your attention is quickly pulled away by two people headed in your direction, walking quickly and speaking in hushed tones. They are wearing matching navy tracksuits. Hmm, those look like uniforms. I didn't think we had uniforms for the gym at Humber. Maybe they're with some theatre group. They could be actors from that theatre at Tobico. But what could they be rehearsing? As the pair get closer to you, you begin to say hello. But they don't even look up at you as they pass. They are solely focused on whatever papers are in their hands. You continue moving, but that odd encounter lingers in your thoughts. Who were they? What were they doing? You feel a cool breeze and your focus turns to the lake. Nearing the shoreline now, you take a deep breath, filling your lungs and breathing in that lake air. This view was well worth the walk down from the college. At this point in time, Humber College had purchased the building that formerly housed the Lakeshore Teachers College, today known as Humber's A Building. Humber would open multiple campuses in the Lakeshore area, and this one was designated Lakeshore One. 
Benjamin would have had to walk around 10 minutes to get down to this path. At this point, you should be at the intersection of pathways, looking south across Swallow Field and a few parking lots around it. Replace in your mind's eye this current swallow field view with an image of the shoreline. This is around where it was at this point in time. Turn left. You should be facing the Great Lakes Waterfront Trail sign for Toronto West Centre. Head along this path until you get to the gazebo. If you get there before I do, pause in a spot close to the gazebo. On May 21st, 1965, the Education Minister, William G. Davis, set the wheels in motion for Humber College to become the thriving institution that it is today. On that day, he introduced a bill which would create 18 Colleges of Applied Arts and Technology. One of these colleges was, yep, you guessed it, Humber College. However, the Lakeshore One campus that Benjamin studies at was not opened until 1976. Suddenly, you remember you have a quiz in your computer programming class this afternoon. Ah, I completely forgot to study for that quiz. You pull out a notebook from your backpack and quickly leaf through your notes, skimming through the relevant pages as you move. Though Humber was on the books to be created in 1965, there were still a lot of questions to be considered, like, what will it be called? In the original bill, it was listed as Area 6. I don't know about you, but I don't think I would go to a school that was simply called Area 6. The first Board of Governors for the school were tasked with naming it. However would they make such a crucial decision? On November 1st, 1966, each board member sat down and wrote out a list of possible names. They then compared what they wrote, and when they saw that Humber was on multiple lists, they decided to go with it. The name likely was inspired by the Humber River system in the area. The name Humber College became officially published on January 7th, 1967. Hmm, seems easy enough. I'm sure I'll be fine for the quiz. It's not like it's worth a lot anyways. Feeling confident in your abilities to wing the quiz, you put away your notebook and focus on the scenery around you. Today, you can see trees to your left, as there were in 1983, but to your right, there is now a pond where the lake would have been. As you move, Try to see if you can spot any turtles. Up ahead, you can just start to see the gazebo. This gazebo was originally built in 1893 by patients at the Lakeshore Psychiatric Hospital. A well-built structure, it has endured and remains functional today. However, There is some controversy about its construction, as it involved patient labor. Patients at the hospital were involved in many labor-intensive projects during its history, as it was a key component of the treatment ideology in use at the time. I think I'll stop there for a moment, and then head back to campus. Suddenly, You hear people running on the grass, talking, and a whistle blowing on your left. You can't see much past the trees, but you can tell it's coming from the cricket pitch. What could they be doing over there? You get close to the gazebo, but your attention is drawn to a piece of paper on the ground next to it. You hurry over and pick it up, hoping it will be another clue to what those people are involved in. 
It looks like part of a script. Hmm. So this character, Martine, says, You a cadet? And then someone named Mahoney says, I am, until I can get myself thrown out of here. I'll be gone by ten. What a weird goal. There are also camera directions, so it can't be for a theatre production. Is this for some student film project? Do we even have film students at our campus? At this point, you should be standing near the gazebo. You put the paper in your pocket, thinking the mystery solved. After a few moments, you almost turn left to head back down the path you walked initially, but as you do, a man approaches you that looks oddly familiar, though you can't quite place his face. He is dressed in the same navy tracksuit as the people who passed you earlier. This time, you can see a crest on the shirt, but you can't quite tell what it says. He walks past you and the gazebo, heading further east down the path. Your curiosity gets the better of you, and after a brief moment of hesitation, you decide to continue east down the path as well, following in the man's footsteps. There must be something bigger happening here. I may be late for class, but I'm going to figure out what's going on. You've walked this path many times since beginning your studies at Humber, and until today, it has been relatively uneventful. Though, I suppose there was that time I saw two birds fighting over a piece of food. As you continue moving, you keep checking over your shoulder to see if there are any other people passing through this area, but it's now as quiet as any other day. Listen to the birds you can hear around you. Are they loons? Ducks? Red-necked grebes? It could be any of these birds, as they are all known to inhabit the area of Lake Ontario. Were you to dive right on into the water and swim far enough, you may encounter fish such as rainbow trout or Chinook salmon, also known to inhabit the lake. You let your mind drift to thinking about this wildlife around you, to the point that you almost forget why you are still heading along this path. By this point, you know that your lunch break is officially over. You are definitely late for class. Seeing no one around you, you begin to question your decision. Until you see a man walking towards you. He carries a large briefcase and is holding a clipboard. As he nears you, you can see the papers on the clipboard are similar to what the pair were holding earlier. Is he involved in this film project too? The man stumbles over a rock, dropping the clipboard on the ground. It falls at your feet. Pause where you are. You kneel down to pick up the clipboard. You only get a chance to read the title before the man angrily snatches it back. You start moving down the path again. A call sheet? Oh, I wish I could have seen some of the names on it. I might have been able to figure out if it's just students involved. You continue questioning the encounters you've had. Are all of the people you passed working on the same project? Are they from Humber? It's probably going to end up being nothing. Should I just go back now? If we were going to continue going straight to the end of this path, we would be walking into a residential street. But we aren't going that far today. We will be stopping at the spot where a path heading north intersects with the path you are on. As you look left up that path, you should just be able to make out Cumberland House. You should be stopped at this point now. At this literal and figurative crossroad, you pause. As you are about to turn around and head to class, you hear shouting along the path to Cumberland House. You can see a flurry of activity outside the house, and you make your decision. Head north up this pathway.
you barely notice that you are passing trees on your left and houses on your right. So intent are you on figuring out what is happening up ahead. You should be heading in the direction of Cumberland House, but if you get there before I do, just keep heading north along the path and stop when you get to the crosswalk at Colonel Samuel Smith Park Drive. Your pulse races as you dare to hope that this could be a big budget movie. I've heard this area has been popular for filmmakers, but I've never actually seen a crew in action here. Filming on the lakeshore grounds would not have been a new phenomenon in 1983. Prior to this year, the site had been used in films Equus, Phobia, Strange Invaders, and Strange Brew. The last two were released in theaters in 1983. Ontario has been a particularly attractive option for filmmakers since the Ontario Film Development Corporation, today known as the Ontario Media Development Corporation, waived the cost of location rental on properties owned by the provincial government. Since the Lakeshore Psychiatric Hospital was owned by the provincial government while it operated and continued to be maintained by them after its closure, it was a financially beneficial location for production teams. Other reasons why this area was popular are for its beautiful buildings and landscape, which provide a lovely backdrop for many different kinds of scenes, and limited traffic noise as the area is far enough away from the street. The tunnels that exist under the cottages are also a rather convenient way to move equipment between buildings. You try to figure out what this movie could be about, based on the clues you've seen so far today. The matching navy tracksuits, a character calling another a cadet in the script, and the activity happening on the cricket pitch. Have you figured it out yet? You should soon be nearing Cumberland House, and you find your eye drawn to the activity on the lawn. I don't usually follow this path while I'm on a break, so I can't tell if there's normally this many people working in front of Cumberland House. The building was originally constructed as the Lakeshore Psychiatric Hospital Superintendent's Residence in 1895, largely using what was officially termed institutional labour, aka patient labour. It was named for the last superintendent to live in the house, Dr. Thomas Daly Cumberland, who served as superintendent from 1936 to 1959. The building was later used for patient programming, but today is used by the Jean Tweed Center, an organization that provides mental health services. You can see people outside the house carrying large objects. At first, you can't tell what they are carrying, but getting closer, you can see they are film cameras. The cameras are large and look expensive, leading you to believe that this actually is a professional production. You see these people checking the equipment, untangling cords, and carrying everything inside. As the path curves slightly left leading up to Colonel Samuel Smith Park Drive, you spot the man you vaguely recognized at the gazebo. He is standing at the intersection, reading what you now believe to be a script. You rack your brain trying to remember his name. I feel like it starts with an S. Sean? Stanley? No, those don't sound right. You quicken your pace as you head towards the intersection, hoping to talk to the man when you get there, as he could be a famous actor. But what will you say to greet him if you still can't remember his name? I don't want a repeat of what happened when I met Christopher Plummer. Your opportunity to meet the man evaporates as you see him turn left and hurry away. Getting closer to the intersection, though, you can see the outline of a large, circular sign on the lawn. You can make out the words, Police Academy. The movie Police Academy was the first of a series, 
not all of which filmed on the Lakeshore grounds, though they would return here to film the third and fourth installments as well. The first was filmed here in 1983 and released the following year. The comedy follows a group of recruits in training to be police officers, right after the city relaxed their restrictions on who could be accepted into training. At this point, you should be standing at the intersection. Cross the street safely and pause there. Now that you have crossed the street, turn left to continue along the sidewalk, but don't cross the next street yet. Police Academy was filmed primarily in and around the former Lakeshore Psychiatric Hospital Cottages and Cricket Pitch, at the Assembly Hall, and at Cumberland House. We are currently heading towards the cottages. Cumberland House, which we passed earlier, was used for the Commandant's residence in the film. We will be seeing the cricket pitch shortly, though we will not be passing by the Assembly Hall. If you are interested in passing by that building, at the end of this experience, I will indicate where you can find it. At this point, you should be at the next part of the street. Now you may cross the street, when it is safe to do so. Continue moving straight forward until you get to the sidewalk. When you get to the sidewalk, turn left and walk along the cottages. You should be passing three cottages, now called buildings F, G, and H. Humber College eventually signed a 99-year lease on the Lakeshore Psychiatric Hospital buildings in 1989. With the student population at the Lakeshore One campus rising, administrators saw the hospital buildings as a possible solution. They considered using the space for a student residence, classes, and art studios. However, Many of those plans did not come to fruition, and the cottages today are primarily used for classes. These cottages we are passing are visible in the movie in multiple outdoor scenes. For example, when the recruits arrive at the campus. Cottage G, which is the central building here, was also used to film some interior office shots in the film. As you walk along the edge of the cottages, you begin to hear what sounds like a commotion. It seems to be coming from behind these cottages. You quicken your pace, hoping to catch a glimpse of something exciting around the corner. I wish I had my camera with me. The coven would probably love to do a story on this. The coven likely would have loved to run this story as The Coven was a newspaper written and produced by Humber College students. There were different editions for each campus, with the Lakeshore Coven operating between 1980 and 1984. Today, The Coven has evolved to become Humber, etc. Running a story about a large-scale professional film being shot right in their own backyard would have been a thrilling story for Humber students to follow in 1983. Filming on the Lakeshore campus would continue to be exciting news for students, as even since Humber leased the cottages, filming hasn't stopped in this area. Since the filming of the first Police Academy, the grounds have been host to Canadian and international production crews for many projects, some you may recognize like the recent DC anti-hero film, Suicide Squad, the TV adaptation of Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, and most recently, the Netflix show, Lock and Key. At this point, 
you should be nearing the part of the path that curves right around the final building on this strip. The parking lot that was to your left should now be somewhat behind you. Head right around the corner of this cottage, following the curve of the sidewalk. Continue moving until you get to the end of I building, the first full cottage you should be able to see on your right after you get past the building whose corner you are currently walking around. Moving along in this area, you realize you are now heading right into the center of the filming activity. You see actors dressed in costumes are getting their makeup done, people are shouting orders at assistance, and large filming equipment is being moved. With so many people around, I doubt anyone will notice I'm not supposed to be here. Having never seen a big budget film being produced, you watch in awe as you move. It seems like a lot of activity, but when you watch individual people, you can tell everyone is performing their own specific and important role in the production. The screeching of car tires jolts your attention away from the people working and towards the cottages on your right. You try to peek behind the cottages, but you can't get a clear view because of the tops of the tunnels that you can see connect to each cottage. Today, you can see it is solid stone, but when Police Academy was filming, it would have also had a black metal railing around it. The tunnels were originally built at the Lakeshore Psychiatric Hospital and were used to transport goods and services between the cottages when the institution was in operation. If you look closely, you can see windows that have been sealed since the closure of the hospital. At this point, you should be right outside I building and beside the cricket pitch to your left. Within the inner courtyard of the cottages today is Humber's L building as well as pathways that connect to each of the buildings. However, dispel that image from your mind, because in 1983, what lies inside those cottages was a parking lot. And it is that parking lot which the production crew are using to film a standout moment in Police Academy. Any guesses what scene it was? You keep moving down the path in a western direction as you keep trying to get a glimpse of the cars driving in the inner courtyard. All you are able to see are a few flashes of cars swerving around. Must be a big car chase or something. The scene they are filming in the parking lot is from a part in the movie where the recruits are doing a driving evaluation. In the scene, they swerve around various obstacles and through a shower of water. The sound of someone barking orders on the cricket pitch pulls your attention away from the car chase and towards the cricket pitch on your left. Now that you are able to see the full expanse of the pitch, you can see what they are doing there. There are no cameras around, but there is a group of people moving around, appearing to be rehearsing or blocking out positions for a scene. Looks like some sort of training scene. That must be why there are so many people dressed in tracksuits. They are, in fact, rehearsing for a training scene. A series of training scenes appear in the movie. The shoreline, which would have been evident to the south of the cricket pitch, provided a backdrop for these scenes where recruits are put to the test in obstacle courses, strength training, and through running exercises. As you move, you glance back and forth between the cricket pitch, the people working around you, and the car scene, trying to take in everything you are seeing. Up ahead, you can see the man from the gazebo again. He is talking to some of the production crew members. As you get nearer to him, you start to plan out what you are going to say, but you still can't remember his name. I know he must be a famous actor, but how can I talk to him if I don't know his name? 
as you get close to where he is standing, you try to figure out what to say if you can't remember his name, but, fearing embarrassment, when you take a step towards him, you change gears and continue moving on the path. As you hurry away, it heartbreakingly dawns on you. Steve Gutenberg. That's his name. You turn around, hoping to talk to him now that you should be able to introduce yourself in a non-embarrassing fashion. But you see, he has disappeared from sight. A disappointing moment, but overall, it has been a thrilling afternoon, watching a real film production crew in action. As you are nearing Colonel Samuel Smith Park Drive, you decide it is now time to head back to class. Over the years, Humber College as an institution has continued to expand, partner with institutions like Orangeville and the University of Guelph, host famous guests like Margaret Atwood, and transform rapidly to meet the needs of the thousands of students admitted yearly. I invite you to take one last look behind you at the exciting production before you bring yourself back to the present year. We are going to let Benjamin get back to class now, and depending on where you originally came from to begin this experience, you may start to make your way back there now. If you started in the parking lot at the powerhouse, turn left down Colonel Samuel Smith Park, while if you started north, closer to Lakeshore Boulevard, turn right and head up the street. Heading north is also where you will find the assembly hall. Thank you for joining me in this journey through time. I hope you had fun on the trip. If you enjoyed this experience, you can explore more of the Lakeshore Grounds Interpretive Center's offerings, including additional guided journeys through time, at our website, lakeshoregrounds.ca. Narration for this experience has been provided by Miranda Tippins, and the voice of Benjamin has been provided by Philip Goodchild with additional support from the Humber Archives team.